Thank you very much. Good morning. It's great to be here. Thanks to Heather for persistently inviting me to the point where I couldn't say no anymore. But it's a lovely place. I really enjoy being here. Um, I'm going to start off with a, a question and listen carefully because it's a very cool prize for the person that gets this right. What have post-it notes, chocolate chip cookies, lollipops, tea bags, crisps or potato chips, whatever you call them here, <laughs> microwave ovens, penicillin, Teflon, crowdsourcing, language subtitling, solar power for maternity wards have in common? NASA. Boo, you got it right straight away. Okay, well there's a book here for you when you... Um, <laughs> I was hoping for some crazier, kind of like, they're all magic, or whatever answers, but I didn't get those. Yeah, you're right, they actually were unintended inventions, so to speak. The, the people that, that created those things did not set out to create those things, but they ended up as the result of the work that they were doing. Now, I don't actually like the word accident, because it sort of implies luck, and a lot of work went into all of those things before they actually were created, even if they weren't intended from the outset. And I think there's some interesting things that we can learn from all of those examples. Some are more trivial than others. Chop chip cookies, clearly very important. Some of the others may be slightly lower down the scale. If we go back a little bit through these examples, if we, if we start with this one, this is a friend of mine called Eric Hurstman. He's one of the co-founders of Ushahidi, which was discussed yesterday during the very first talk yesterday morning. Eric's the Kenyan blogger. Uh, he was living in Florida at the time. All these sort of Kenyan blogger friends were in various parts of the world. The Kenyan elections kicked off in 2007, and out of the blue, almost by total surprise, nobody saw it coming, this happened, the Kenyan elections turned, turned nasty and people started getting hurt, and people started getting killed, communities started breaking down, there were mobs on the streets, and it, it was just a complete shock to everybody, and Eric and his friends were just very concerned, they were watching from a distance their country falling apart. And they were watching the news and reading the reports coming out of the country, and they realized that almost everything that they were seeing was coming from the main population centers. Nobody was capturing the things that were going on in the smaller rural areas. They weren't capturing peace initiatives, where people were actually trying to stop the violence and, and bring peace to communities, and that's clearly very important. And they realized that once this was all over, in order to reconcile the country and figure out what went wrong, we, they needed to know, and the country needed to know what happened where where the acts of violence were, what had happened, and so on. So they created a map, and they called it Ushahidi. Now, Ushahidi was created over three or four days by a, a, a diverse group of people across many countries. It had no money, it had no five-year plan, it had no real idea, in fact, but all they needed was a map to capture news and information as it happened, and it allowed people to text things in, to email things in, to fill in web forms. Ushahidi today is used in about 170, 180 countries, and it often forms part of the international relief effort when there's a natural disaster or otherwise. And I find that quite fascinating that something which has become so critical and so widely acclaimed started off with a bunch of people spread over four or five, four continents or whatever it might be, with no money and no plan. And there's a lesson in there somewhere, I think. Another example, this is Bridge Kathari, a friend of mine. I met him at Stanford a few years ago. Bridge was sitting in New York, one night, one Saturday night, with his friends, they were eating pizza, and they were watching this film. Who's seen this film? Anyone? Is it a good film? All right. It's a Spanish film, though, right? So there obviously are some good Spanish films. Uh, now, Bridge and his friends were learning Spanish at the time, and they were watching the film. Subtitles were in English, and the audio was in Spanish. And during a toilet break, Bridge just randomly, casually mentioned wouldn't it be cool if the subtitles were also in Spanish? Because we're trying to learn Spanish, and if we could read it and hear it at the same time, it might help us with our language learning. And what if we got Bollywood and all the Hindi pop videos that kids watch to put the words on the screen in the language that the children are hearing? Would that help them learn to read? And, you know, subtitles are usually in a different language to the one you're listening to. They translate. The idea of having it in the same language was, was kind of new, particularly in education. And, and literacy. So Bridge came up with the idea of same language subtitling, SLS, is an example of it here. And today, same language subtitling is helping in the region of 300 million Indian school children get their first taste of literacy. It's a proven technology. Again, no money, no five-year plan, no big vision, just a problem which 
sort of jumped, jumped that bridge almost in a sense, just randomly, but one that he realized was big and needed to be fixed. And again, I think there's a lesson in that. And then the final example, those of you that heard the NPR interview uh, the other day will know this one. This is Laura Statchel, another friend of mine, who is a maternal nurse in the US, and she has a practice, and she's part of quite often the joyous process of helping women give birth to their children. And she got interested in global health after a few things happened in her life, and she sort of diverted her attention. And she went to Nigeria, and she was interested in just understanding what some of the problems were around maternal care in developing countries. Now, one night she was uh, just going about her own business, wandering around, and she saw this. She walked into a ward, and she saw a lady at a desk with a kerosene lamp and pitch black. Now, around that desk is about 30 beds with women and babies, and you can't see them because there's no power. It's dark, there's no power, there's no lights. But what was worse was that that night Laura saw a woman coming in after spending a day getting to the hospital. She had severe complications of her pregnancy and they couldn't help her because they couldn't operate. And she died. And Laura just could not believe that in this day and age, women and babies were dying because there was something so simple as no light. It, it really got to her as a human, as a human being, forget the fact she's a maternal nurse, it gets to me as a person, I'm not a maternal nurse, I know very little about health, but it just seems very, very wrong that that should be something that still exists today. So she thought, well, okay, I never, never thought I'd see this, but someone's got to fix it. And if I don't, probably no one else will. So she spoke to her husband, Hal, and he's a, a solar engineer, luckily, and they built this. Right? They had a few little plays, but they came out with the idea of doing this. They built this solar suitcase, which has got batteries and, and, a, and a, a panel, and it's got little sockets for mobile phones and walkie-talkies and various things. You put it outside during the day, it charges up nicely, you bring it at night, and if something happens at night, you get it going, and suddenly you can operate with light. Ridiculously simple. Why are we always looking to fix the big complicated problems when these kind of problems still exist? It's kind of mad, right? Now, women in hundreds of maternity wards across the world are now benefiting from this technology. No longer are they holding their mobile phones in their mouths just to see a little bit of what they're doing, or even, as in one case, burning a calendar just to get enough light to be able to see and finish an operation. And I think these stories matter. Laura's story and Bridge and Eric's are all in this book that I published last year called The Rise of a Reluctant Innovator. Reluctance is a key word for me because these are hard things to fix, and it's an easier life path for the people that chose to fix them, the easier life path was to ignore it and just carry on as we were. But we need people who put their necks out and choose the more difficult path because these problems need to be fixed. And one of the reasons they need to be fixed is that the traditional aid system that we have today does have its faults. Clearly good stuff happens. I'm not going to stand here and say how rubbish it all is because good things do happen. But there are a number of key criticisms of the development and aid system. And a, a few of those are First, aid is often wasted on conditions that the recipient must use overpriced goods and services from donor countries. You know, when a $10 billion grant is given, you might find eight or nine billion of that money is spent within the country that gave the money to hire people and to, to buy trucks. It's also tied up. It's clearly not a very good way of going about it. Most aid doesn't actually get to the people that we, we know it needs to get to. There are problems in the system. The system just doesn't seem to allow it to get down to the bottom. There's market problems. If you think about all the aggregated value of perhaps every agriculture project that's working with farmers across Africa and all the good that that's doing, if you simply lifted the international trade barriers that are up against those farmers and allowed them to trade freely, they would probably be better off. So despite all the good effort, if you're fighting against a system which is inherently working against the people you're trying to help, you're only really ever going to scratch the surface, you're working in a system that just does not work for the greater good, but that's kind of what we do. And we do it because it's the right thing to do, but if the system could just be changed, then perhaps things would be a lot better if we forgot about the protectionism and all the kind of stuff that we build up around these projects to ensure that the aid industry can support itself and keep itself going. Embezzlement, corruption, there's a lot of belief and a lot of proof and a lot of talk about how this huge amount of aid just creates corrupt environments and give people the opportunity to, to embezzle and steal money. And then finally, uh, this, this figure really kind of jumped out at me, 60 years and three trillion dollars. I don't know about you, but uh, three trillion is, a, is three billion billion, right? Am I right in that? It's a lot of noughts. And 60 years is quite a long time. 
do you think we have had value for money for spending $3 trillion if we look at where things are today? And in some cases, yes, things have worked, but in a lot of cases, they haven't worked. And I think we could probably maybe spend $3 trillion slightly better than the way, perhaps, that we've done that. But I'm not going to just stand here and say how rubbish it all is. I think it's just important that we're aware that the wider system that we're trying to work within is fundamentally, in many cases, working against what we're trying to do. And it's, a, it's, a, it's beyond all of us, probably, to fix that. So what we have to do is we have to work outside of the system in order to make change. And I think almost everybody in this room, in one way or another, is working outside the system, going their own path, going their own route, getting themselves out there, looking at problems and taking them on because it's the right thing to do and not looking forward the more traditional path of working through the bigger organisations. These debates, of course, have been going on for quite a long time. Who knows who these two chaps are? I'm sure most people do. Easterly and Sachs. Who follows them on Twitter? It's hilarious, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's like a soap. They're constantly slagging each other and having a go at each other. And, and, but they are on completely opposite sides of the fence. And I'm sure they do this thing on purpose. They've both got books out at the same time this year. That's clearly coordinated. You know, it's a, it's a play. It's, it's entertaining and it's fun, but it's not helpful. It's not helpful because it just becomes fun and a sideshow. And actually, the issues are really, really important. Bill Easterly through White Man's Burden and his new book, The Tyranny of Experts, is basically but it says that the aid system is broken and we, aid is bad fundamentally and we need to think about other ways of creating structures and systems that allow countries to build their own way out of the problems that they have. And Sachs on the other side with his Millennium Villagers and other plans wants more aid, more money. There couldn't really be more polarising views on what the future of this is. And there is probably no answer and we probably won't come out with an answer because the debate will just go on and on. And in the meantime people will suffer and problems will get worse and again People like the people in this room will be the ones that will have to pick up on those problems and fix them, because that's the only way I think many of these problems today are going to be fixed. And there is a third way. There's a guy called Paul Polak, who some of you again may have, may have heard of. Uh, Paul has this very strong belief that it's business which will solve many of the problems of the world today. We need business models, we need to sell products to people, we need to treat recipients of aid as consumers, as customers. We build products that they want, and we know they want them because they pay for them. If you give stuff away for free, you never really know if what you're building is wanted because people will gladly take anything for free. But if it costs $2, then they're not going to buy it if it works for them. And that almost solves one of the bigger problems immediately that we have in the aid sector at the moment where everything is kind of just by default given away for free. And Paul gets a hard time because people say to him, you should not be making profit from the poor. But if you can make 50 cents off a $2 sale, you can use that money to build the business, you can build new products, you can improve the products, it becomes sustainable. Again, I don't know if this is the answer, but it's kind of another way of thinking about how we might be able to unlock some of these sort of fundamental problems that clearly exist. And then, what I've been doing over the last nearly 10 years now, it's hard to believe that this software's been around for nearly 10 years, uh, is that you know, I, I am an optimist. Like Josh said yesterday, I, I, I'm very much in the sense of the campus here. I believe that we, you know, we can make progress, we can do good things. But um, you know, we need to do it, for me, outside of the system. Frontline SMS is something I developed in 2005, which is built on that optimism. The belief is that if you give people the tools that they need, and you step back and let them get on with it, that the people that own the problems, who have a vested interest in solving that problem, are usually more than capable of figuring out for themselves, without me having to jump on a plane and do it for them. It's a much more respectful kind of development, I believe. The best way of describing this software is to show you a very short five minute video, in fact, of, of what it does, and then I'll move on briefly from there. So we'll just cue this video. quite a bit of time in South Africa and Mozambique looking at how mobile technologies could be useful. I think there's a tendency when we look at innovation today that we think immediately of iPads and smartphones. The important thing is to lead with the problem, lead with the people, and the answer may be a crayon at the end of the day. I was meeting lots of non-profits working in rural areas who were also very interested in figuring out how they could use phones. But people weren't building tools that to me seemed to particularly work very well in those places. 
When I set out to solve the communication problems that I saw in, in South Africa, that's really all I was trying to do. Just really sticking to the root thing that we were trying to solve. It's sending a text message to somebody and getting a reply back. I don't know specifically where the idea came from. It, it really did just appear and I scribbled some notes down. Most of the things I was interested in were the problems. It was conservation or human rights or agriculture or climate change. All this stuff bugs me. You can't do all those things, but I somehow managed to create a piece of software that allows me to contribute to all the things that concern me all in one go. Frontline SMS turns a, a low-cost laptop computer and a mobile phone and a cable into a two-way text messaging system which allows non-profits working in developing worlds to run automated text messaging services with rural communities. And you can use it with very, very little computer skills or experience. Healthcare workers, farmers, human rights activists, election monitors, whoever you're trying to communicate with, type a message and send it to all of those people. SMS is, in a sense, quite an old technology. It's been around for a long time, um, and hence it's so accessible. The fact is, there's five billion mobile phones in the world today, and that's a very accessible technology, whereas the internet isn't so accessible. I think before Ken, there was always either or. Use a laptop or use a mobile phone. In a country that is 25 million people mobile phones, so you can't really you, you can't really avoid that platform. But secondly, yes, you have a mobile phone, but you need something that enables, that can harness the power of that phone. When I released the software in 2005, we had our first user in Zimbabwe after about a week, and I was very excited to have one user. Suddenly in April 2007, a loose coalition of Nigerian NGOs took the software and helped monitor their national elections. And it was the first time it's believed that African NGOs have monitored their own elections using mobile technology. I think suddenly the idea that, that everyday citizens could actually report things changed the way people thought about how they might go about trying to swing an election. Uh, and I think that's had a, a wider impact in you know, all around the world. I think people have put their necks on the line for that type of work. The least I can do is do my best to support them. I'm not on the, the front line of this. Uh, they are. Harassmap was really concerned with the level of harassment on Egyptian streets, so they created an SMS service using Frontline SMS to allow people to send reports when they experienced harassment. They also used an online crowdsourced mapping tool so that they could then respond to the areas where harassment was most prevalent. One of the key things with Frontline SMS is as an organisation, we don't deploy the software ourselves in developing countries. We make it available to existing non-profits and grassroots organisations. If we hadn't open sourced it, we would not have had this rich ecosystem of developers. People working in certain sectors have identified some additional functionality that could be added to the software, which makes it more useful and more relevant. Frontline SMS Medic, are building patient record keeping systems that are powered by text message. Frontline SMS Credits are building microfinance modules. And the newest one coming out later in the year, Frontline SMS Media, will allow us to build citizen journalism, data collection, um, news story tools to report things that are happening uh, where they are. When you get a group that has been oppressed, that has been so dispossessed, and all of a sudden they find something that, that renews that hope, for me that's, that, that becomes a really inspiring moment, and that is where change happens. The logo for Frontline SMS um, here on this badge is uh, backslash lowercase o forward slash. It's a text representation of somebody who would feel empowered, which is the message that the software seems to give. It's textable because it uses standard characters available on the keyboards. And also we get photographs from users in the field actually sending in workshops and their staff feeling, yes, we've got our system running and we're, we're empowered. So we see our role very much as building tools and allowing the people who actually own the problem to solve it. Um, those figures are slightly out of date now. It's now had over a quarter of a million downloads and it's 190 countries, so it's almost literally gone, gone global. And the thing, the thing for me that really stands out from this is I've not done any of that work. All of those uses, all of the people that are using it among, in, in 20 different sectors of development, they've all done the work themselves. 
I've not had to fly out to do any training or any installation. It's all about the user. And when National Geographic gave me an award, I don't know, three or four years ago, they wanted photographs of me in the field with users to use in the magazine. I don't have any. I literally don't have, after nine years, any pictures of me with users because it doesn't work that way. And I'm very proud of that, that I actually haven't had to go out and do that. We've created genuine empowerment. And the lesson is, if you build tools that do that, we can create change by enabling change makers the world over to tackle their own problems on their own terms. So a very quick reality check. What's been going on there is those people just got on and fixed stuff, right? What the system tends to do is just write lots of reports and thinks a lot about it and tries to figure out what it should do. And those reports might be useful. They might even get read. Amazing, right? But there's this, this sort of, you know, academia and, and pra practitioners do have a certain amount of tension, and you often see it at conferences. And there is definitely a divide there, that there are people that are writing for themselves, and there are people that write to try and make the greater, greater good work for the greater number of people. But the people out there, the people working outside the system, the owners of the problems, the healthcare workers, the farmers, cooperatives, the human rights activists, they're just getting on and doing stuff. And I love people like that. There's no reason why you can't just get on and do stuff. Don't get caught up in all the politics and all the mess of the system and everything that builds around it, because it doesn't really work that way. And in the tech world that I live in, we have our own kind of unique problems. This is how we've traditionally seen technology and innovation. It's the fastest, it's the smallest, it's the greatest, it's the coolest, it's the most innovative. It's stuff that comes out of places like this. If you ask most people on the street what they think innovation is, they're probably going to mention Apple within the first 10 or 20 seconds. And to a point there, very, very correct. But when we think about development, it doesn't really work that way. This is a tweet I grabbed from two or three years ago. Somebody in Addis Ababa talking at a conference about how African farmers can use iPads. I don't think I've ever seen an African farmer with an iPad. I doubt many have iPads. But one day they may, and in, in which case, if that happens, yes, let's start talking about African farmers and iPads if they get those iPads, which I doubt they ever will. We do have a kind of strange habit of building technology for technology's sake, because it's cool and exciting. The best example of this, two weeks ago, I was in an office, an iPad-powered coffee machine. Why? <laughs> why? Please tell me why you would want to create an iPad-powered coffee machine. What do we really need? What's wrong with pressing normal buttons? It's just, it, it just completely flummoxes me. Now this is fine because the company's paid a lot of money for this and, and they're probably rich, but if we start spending aid money and we start spending money that needs to be spent on proper things, on stuff like this, we've got an even bigger problem than we thought. And the kind of sector is stuck in this in a little way. It's starting to move out now. I think people that work outside the system are more aware of this than those that work within it. But there's a tendency to think about how we can do cool stuff with phones like this, when the reality is that most of the people that we're trying to help have phones like this. And that still exists. And I kind of bang my head sometimes when I think about talks I gave five years ago talking about this, and people are still doing it. Not that people should listen to me, but it's clearly not the right way to go, regardless of who's saying it, I don't think. The days of people jumping on planes with solutions built far, far away from the problems, without any local involvement, without any local context or understanding, they really now should be over, I think. I think we need to seriously try to figure out how we can stop that. And again, the more people that start to work outside of the system, the closer we will get to fixing this. Because these are people who have found problems, or problems have found them, and they've taken a deep interest in fixing them because they've troubled them, and they've gone right to their heart. And when you see a problem that goes right to your heart, it's really hard to quit. If you're just solving a problem, there's plenty of problems out there. When you get stuck on one problem, you just move to another. That's not how we're going to fix the problems. We need to fix problems that really get to the gut of who we are and want to make us get up in the morning. And when I think about technology and how we build tools that fix these problems, I wrote this for The Guardian about three years ago, and again, it still stands true today, and probably in 10 years' time when I'm old and grey and maybe have no hair, I'll show the same slide and maybe the same thing will be happening. But I do deeply believe that it's homegrown innovators, it's homegrown solutions, it's how we create environments that allow those people on the ground who have grown up with the problems that are going to be the ones that fix them. The reason you guys all work with community healthcare workers is because they're passionate and they're involved and they're committed and it's their problem to fix. If they weren't like that, you probably wouldn't be that, really be that bothered and I probably wouldn't be either, but these are people who desperately want to make the world a better place and if we can build tools and create environments that let them and their friends do that, then that's really, really important. And one final thing about the system. 
There was some research recently about direct payments to communities living around conservation areas. And the idea was, rather than spending $5 million putting fences around national parks and keeping people out, you just give them the money. You give everybody $10 a month and tell them, don't go in there, don't eat anything, and don't cut anything down. And it kind of worked, right? It gave them something else to do. They could spend the money on other things and build businesses. It kind of worked. The problem was that if that's the future of conservation, what do you do with the 250,000 conservation organizations who exist to put fences around things? They would have to go, and it's not in their interests to go. So we don't follow these solutions sometimes because they don't always fit in with how the system works. So to everyone in this room, keep working outside the system and encourage as many people as you meet to work outside the system. And let's support the people on the ground who are genuinely trying to fix some of the bigger problems in the world that we have to really fix. Thank you very much.